Hello Internet! In today's video, we're going to talk about the best probiotics to use if you have SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Now first, I want to preface this conversation with a little bit of a primer that I want you to know that probiotics are actually very effective for SIBO, and they're one of my favorite tools, and I find that they are very underutilized. A lot of people with SIBO are very afraid to take probiotics, maybe because they've had a negative experience with a probiotic before, and most likely because they've seen on the internet, whether it be in YouTube videos or Facebook forums or Instagram posts, that because they have an overgrowth and overabundance of bacteria, they don't want to add more bacteria into the mix. Now, we've talked about this a little bit in recent videos, such as the one about soil-based probiotics, but the thing to know right off the bat is even if you have an overgrowth, the overgrowth in SIBO appears to never be lactobacillus or bifidobacterium. And that automatically puts all of these probiotics, or most of them, automatically on the market for you as a SIBO sufferer because you don't have an overgrowth of lactobacilli. You don't have an overgrowth of bifidobacterium. You have an overgrowth most likely of something from the proteobacteria phylum. That's a little high level for today's conversation. But what I'm going to show you is a handful of research articles that I will use when I'm informing my clinical decision making with my SIBO patients. So let me go ahead and share my screen and I will share these with you. So let's start with this one. This is a 2014 paper titled Evaluating the Efficacy of Probiotic on Treatment in Patients with Small Intestinal Bacterial Overgrowth, a Pilot Study. And this was a really neat paper. And I think a lot of these, you could get the PDFs online. If not, um, I would just use Sci-Hub or something similar. But this particular study, they showed that 93.3% of patients had a negative SIBO hydrogen breath test after the treatment compared to 66% in the placebo group. So that's pretty darn good. I mean, if you think about it, if the only thing that you did to treat your SIBO was a probiotic and you had about a 95% success rate, like that's pretty gosh darn good. I would not argue with those numbers. And if you take a placebo, even without the probiotic, you're gonna get some efficacy there. Now, I think that that ties back with the strong association with vagal nerve dysfunction and autonomic dysfunction in patients with SIBO and the gut-brain axis at play. But nonetheless, you could theoretically take just a probiotic no berberine, no oregano, no PHGG, no nothing like that, and potentially have a 90 plus percent eradication rate of your SIBO, which is pretty freaking cool. Moving on, this was a very good study. I think this was a 2017 paper, and this was a meta-analysis of the research. Now, the thing to know if you guys aren't nerds like me is that a meta-analysis or a systematic review is the highest level research that we have. So these papers are going to look at many different papers and they're going to summarize and talk about the research from those other papers. So they're basing this, this is like a pooling of many different types of papers, many different studies, many different strains of probiotics. And that's important to know too, is that this is pooling the data from many types of probiotics that were studied. So it's gonna be potentially hit and miss depending on what each of those studies showed. But nonetheless, in this meta-analysis, again from 2017, they showed that the pooled SIBO decontamination rate, and I use quotes there because we're not trying to decontaminate the small bowel. You will always have bacteria in your small bowel. But the SIBO cure rate or the decontamination rate was 62.8% in the probiotic groups. And that was significantly higher than any of the placebo groups. So pretty stinking cool. Next, I'll show you one of the studies. This is one of the few studies that I've seen where I was spectacularly underwhelmed by the, um, the efficacy of the data. And if you look, so this was using the bifido strain that is found in a line, and that was in SIBO patients. This was a 2018 article, but they only studied it for two weeks. Look, they did a lactulose breath test, which automatically we know has higher false negatives and higher false net positives than the glucose test. But then we get into this and we see that they only gave these patients two weeks worth of probiotics. I mean, and this is the medical model at work. They give you two weeks of rifaximin and they think, yeah, you're good now. In my experience, especially with natural therapies and especially with like getting to the root cause, you need to give something like a probiotic at least a month, 
I mean, I would, I would give it a minimum of that. And some people I have take probiotics for many months after their SIBO goes away. So I don't think they really gave it a fair shot, but they did find that there was no, no substantial difference. And actually two of the patients in the probiotic group developed SIBO during the course of the two weeks of probiotics. Now, here's the thing though, were they symptomatic? No, they were not symptomatic for SIBO, but two people out of the six probiotic people ended up developing SIBO. Interesting. Maybe it's not the overgrowth that's the problem after all, right? Next up, this was a, another 2018 paper. This is the therapeutic effect of a multi-strain probiotic. Side note, it was one of the Claire products. I think it was Claire, um, I think it was just the, the normal baseline Ther, um, Therala, or not Theralac, um, Clairbiotic, Therabiotic, Probiotic, I believe. They say it in the paper somewhere. But in this particular study, where they looked, they said out of the 11 patients that tested for SIBO at baseline, um, I'm sorry, six out of the 11 patients tested positive for SIBO at baseline, and two out of those six tested negative after the eight weeks of probiotics. So that ends up being, what, 33.33333% efficacy rate? Still not too bad. This was a solo treatment. They didn't do anything that could harm the good bacteria, which is really freaking nice because normally, whether you're taking a prescription antibiotic or a antimicrobial herb, you do run the risk of damaging some of the good bacteria or starving them. And this would have none of that, but it had about a 33% clearance rate. Pretty neat. Then, this is a study, a little different, they're not trying to treat SIBO here, but this is where they administered probiotics with PPI drugs when they were prescribing PPI drugs for children. And what I'll point out that's really neat in this study, let's see, I'll scroll down a bit. Okay, now the thing to know about these graphics is they're not all to scale. So look, the top end of the scale here is seven, the top end here is 40, the top end here is 25. So you have to keep in mind that it, it's going to look a little different. But in the beginning, out of the 120 people who were tested and they were in the control group, six of those children already had SIBO. They weren't symptomatic for SIBO, but they tested positive for SIBO at baseline versus none of the two arms of the study group had SIBO. So they had a placebo group and they had a probiotic group. Then all of these children, so the control group and the two study groups were given PPIs. One group was given PPIs plus a placebo. One group was giving PPIs and a probiotic. And what they showed here was that, all right, the six out of 120 in the control group still had SIBO after the study, but now the study group that got the placebo, or I'm sorry, the control group did not get PPIs. I'm sorry, that was, that was I was mistaken saying that. Um, so the control group had no intervention essentially, and they still six of them had SIBO, but they were not symptomatic for it. Then the placebo group, 36 out of the 64 children developed SIBO when they were given PPIs plus placebo. So over 50% of children ended up developing SIBO when they were on this PPI. Then you look at the probiotic arm and only four of the 64 children developed SIBO when they were on the probiotic in addition to the PPI. So pretty rad. And then this graph over here shows how many people were, or how many children were symptomatic for SIBO and had intestinal symptoms. Again, zero of the control children had intestinal symptoms. So even though six of them had SIBO, none of them were symptomatic. 23 out of the 36 who developed SIBO also had symptoms of SIBO. So pretty good chunk of them. And then none of the children who developed SIBO when they took the, pre the probiotics, none of them were actually symptomatic for SIBO. So we can tell two things from this is that A, the probiotics protected the children from developing SIBO, but it actually also protected them from the symptoms of SIBO even more powerfully. So really neat. Then last couple papers here. This is a brand new study. This is 2020, the efficacy of Saccharomyces boulardii. This is in Floristore. Uh, it's a probiotic yeast and metronidazole for SIBO in systemic sclerosis patients. Now these are gonna be toughies to, to work with because they have sclerosis, they're gonna have a lot of adhesions. But what you can see down here is that after two months of treatment, 
55% of people who took the drug and the probiotic had eradication. 33% of people who just took the probiotic and did nothing else eradicated their SIBO. And 25% of people who just took the drug got rid of their SIBO. So if you look, I mean, I don't think it's statistically significant, but 25 versus 33%, you would actually be better off just taking the probiotic as opposed to taking the metronidazole. No, no GI doctor's going to tell you that, guys. Like, that's, that's a biggie. And then if you look, theoretically, 25% plus 33% ends up being very close to 55. So the two combined, you get an additive effect. Um, that was my attempt at not doing math in my head on a YouTube video. That would have been too awkward. But really compelling. And I really love that probiotic. Hold on. Let's see. Okay. This was a study. This was, let's see, I think 2017 or 18. I forget now. Uh, the effect of probiotic supplementation on GI symptoms and SIBO after ruin Y gastric bypass. So gastric bypass is one of those things that like you're swimming you're swimming upriver in a big way. And it's, go oh, I'm sorry, 2020 study. And this is like, you're physically getting your anatomy changed. People are going in there, surgeons are going in there and they're cutting your stomach. They're cutting out the first part of your small intestine and they're leaving that flapping in the breeze. And it's, it's a very, very intense procedure. I know because my mom has had one. And this study did show that the probiotics didn't protect against SIBO. But again, it's like, is it reasonable to think that you could go into surgery, hack up your digestive organs to bits, and then take a probiotic and move on with your life and not get SIBO? Like, I think that's kind of unreasonable, honestly. And then last but not least, I want to draw attention to this study because I know some of you are probably quite terrified of delactic acidosis. And while I have worked with patients with delactic acidosis, it is not nearly as common as this particular paper makes you think. The thing about it too, and I might've mentioned this in my Somagen Gut Biome Plus video, the thing about D-lactate is, and yes, I'm using Microsoft Paint, judge me if you will, is bacteria make D-lactate. So that could be, you know, lactobacillus, it could be other bacteria as well. But then another bacteria is going to eat the D-lactate and then it could go on to make another compound. And there's probably other things you know, feeding into this. So what you get is you get this really complicated cross-feeding relationship where different bacteria are making different compounds and they're feeding each other and they're, they're producing and consuming different metabolites. D-lactate is just one of those things. For every bacteria that you have that produces D-lactate, you also have several bacteria that consume it. So I don't put a lot of weight personally in the Somagen gut biome test when they talk about D-lactate and they correlate it with fatigue because we can draw conclusions about what the production is, but we can't actually draw conclusions of how much of it is getting consumed. People with D-lactic acidosis might have more of an insufficiency in the good bacteria that consume D-lactate as opposed to an overabundance of the bacteria that produce it. Let me say that again. If you're just going by things like stool testing or symptoms, People who have a D-lactate issue, so like measurable levels of D-lactate upon testing, not stool testing, but like blood or urine, I forget which they do. If they have measurably high levels of D-lactate, the problem might be that they don't have enough of the good bacteria that consume and gobble up D-lactate rather than what most people automatically think, which is that they have an overproduction of the quote unquote bad microbes that are producing D-lactate. We have to look at both sides of the coin. And this particular study had a lot of flaws and it didn't really talk about the cross-feeding very much. Actually, I don't think they mentioned it at all. If you want to learn more about that D-lactic acidosis paper and why I don't think they should be drawing the conclusions that they drew from that paper, I will try to remember to link that video in description. If, you, if I forget to do that, it's on my channel. Just go find it. Just go search D-lactic acidosis on my channel and you will find the video. But you know, this particular paper, if this is what is making you afraid of probiotics, I would not sweat that. And if it's websites like Amy Meyer's website saying that, oh my God, you can't add bacteria on top of bacteria, I wouldn't worry about that either. So you have my official blessing to go try a bunch of probiotics. You know, here we talked about a handful that have shown efficacy for SIBO. 
but there's probably a lot of others that are effective against SIBO and we just haven't studied them yet. Does it mean automatically that a probiotic is ineffective for a, a therapeutic or as a therapeutic tool if we've never studied it? Just because you go on PubMed or just because you go on the internet and you search for, you know, culture L and SIBO, just because we haven't studied it yet doesn't mean it's ineffective. You have my blessing and my encouragement for that matter to go try different probiotics and see if one of them helps mitigate your symptoms and helps you feel better. Because ultimately, that's what you want anyway. Hey guys, if you like this video, be sure to subscribe, ring the bell, click the like button, and leave a comment down below with the videos that you would like to see me do next. Doing all of those really helps support the channel and support my efforts in making as many videos as possible for you guys. Thanks so much, and I'll see you in the next video.